Okay, we're recording. Please go ahead. Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to the meeting of the Finance Committee. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means only. Members of the public who wish access to the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the processing, the proceedings in real time via technological means. I see Alicia has joined us. Uh, seeing a presence of a quorum in the committee, I call the meeting of the Finance Committee to order at 2.05 p.m. Um, if I'm going to go around the room and see if uh, everyone can hear me and can uh, we can hear you. So, uh, Councilor, Councilor Haneke? Present. Kathy? Yes, I'm here. Andy? I'm here. And as I indicated, I will get off in a minute when my computer allows me to and switch devices and I'll confirm again. Okay. Bernie? Present. Alicia? Here. Thank you. Um, so everyone can hear. Um, so, and everyone should be aware that uh, this meeting is being recorded. So um, please bear that in mind. Um, this, uh, uh, um, Athena, or could you put the, the, uh, the uh, meeting uh, agenda up, please? I can't actually right now. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm not in a place where I can do that. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let me see. So anyway, the 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 uh, the agenda is uh, posted. Uh, we have uh, this. The subjects are the 2024 meeting schedule, update on the FY25 projections, uh, the draft on the surplus property disposition policy. I want to have a short discussion of the Amherst Pel Pelham Regional School Committee rescission and replacement of the debt authorization, uh, public comments, topics not reasonably anticipated, and then we'll adjourn. So uh, let's start with the uh, 2024 meeting schedule. Does anyone have any changes they want to make to the meeting schedule? Okay, not seeing any. We adopted one last time, didn't we? Yeah, we did. I just okay. wanted to make sure if anyone had any any changes. Um, okay, so we'll just keep it as is. Um, and uh, Paul, I don't think there is an update on the 25 projections, but if you have any information, please let us know. Um, we continue to work on it. There, there's still some numbers that, are, that we're trying to finalize. So we hope to have that in the very near future, though, certainly by your next meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's dive in to the draft surplus property disposition policy. Um, this may be something where we should put the policy document up on, on screen. Um, Kathy, can you do that? Do you have the ability to do that? Yeah, um, let me just find it while you're talking. And the question I have, Bob, is we actually... We have the current one, meaning the old one, and we have the draft. So is the one you want to put up the uh, draft? The revision? draft with all the comments in it. Okay. And and uh, I will do that. Let me just take a second to find it. Sure. And I have received some, um, some comments from the public, um, which I will try to weave into our conversation. <laughs> So it, it looks like we have um, a fair amount of comment regarding the the sort of the, the steps one through X uh, of the process. And uh, so there's some clarifications that people want and some, some other issues that people have brought up, so.
Can, can yeah. people see that? Yeah. Um, so I, I know that uh, I see uh, Dave Zomack is here. Dave, did you want to lead the discussion on this or have uh, Athena lead the discussion on this? Um, thanks, Bob. You know, I think Athena and I are are here to participate. We're here to listen. Um, you know, we've we've seen some of the comments that have come back from the council. I don't believe I've seen any that have come back from the public, so I'm interested in those as well. But we, I think, we were hoping to, you know, kind of have a have a, a give and take back and forth here and on, on what some of the council concerns are. I don't think we'll be able to answer all of your questions today, but um, you know, Athena and I work together. Um, as you know, I and my staff are often involved in properties around town that the town owns and manages and is either in the past or are currently considering um, alternative uses for if they are if they are quote underutilized and um, thanks in large part to Athena with her knowledge of the charter uh, she really took a very hard and close look at the old policy under our former um, form of government and then um, worked to redraft that uh, to be in line with the with the charter and and the current roles and responsibilities of the town manager and the and the council. So I'm happy to have Athena chime in if she wanted to say more, but I think we're we're interested in your comments, your concerns, your questions, and um, and where we might go from here. Hey, uh, Kathy, I don't think this is the one that has all the comments in it, unless you've not. The, this is um, the draft, the draft one. Um, Athena, when you sent it, this is the one with, with the red lines, but it's, uh, I, I don't have an ability. I don't have the word version of it. Um, I have the PDF version of it. Okay, I can send you the word version, but there is a, there is a PDF in the packet that has comments and other changes. Okay, so, so I'm, I've got the wrong version then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It should, it should have, uh, it should say, it should be a, a blue legal requirements on the first line. Yeah, okay. it, it's called member edit. It, at the end, it says member edits and comments. Yeah. Oh, it's so member edits and comments were mm -hmm. in it. And, yeah. Mandy, if you have it, I'm going to just let you share screen too. Oh, okay. Then I won't spend time searching for it. <laughs> Uh, so a, if if I can, um, Bob, make a couple of comments before sure. just to begin. So the the council steps of the process are first to declare a property surplus. So it would begin with a town manager request the council declare a property surplus, um, and then the council would authorize the issuance of an RFP, um, and then. Finally, after that process, they the council would vote to accept a proposal and authorize the town manager to sign a purchase and sale agreement. Um, so there were some comments that I received from the committee about the public process that was removed from the previous draft or the previous the current policy. Um, and the the one of the main differences between the previous form of government and this form of government is the the function, you know, the role of the chief executive is previously being the select board and that advisory committee advising the select board. And now that we have a town manager, the town manager may form an advisory committee to advise him about whether to propose or to request the council declare a property surplus. And that's completely within the purview of the town manager to seek advice from staff or whomever he wishes when he's uh, considering declaring or asking the council to declare a property surplus. Um, and so there were some comments about who would be on um, an advisory committee to the town manager, but it's really up to the town manager to seek advice from whoever he wishes. And uh, Andy's joined twice, so there's some feedback. <laughs> Just gonna mute that. So um, there is, and I've reviewed the surplus 
property disposition policies in several other cities and towns. And so that's what I used as sort of a jumping off uh, point mm -hmm. in drafting this version. So my suggestion, if there is a desire to incorporate a public process, some other cities had a threshold. So if a property was over a certain or the value was over a certain dollar amount, then the process would vary. Um, and the, you know, the intensity of the public input would be more if it were a larger property or a higher valued property. So one option is for the incorporation of a committee to um, develop an RFP and review bids. Um, and then they would make a recommendation to either the town manager or town council before the council accepted a proposal. So that could be worked in, but it wouldn't be an advisory committee to the town manager, it would be advisory to the council. Um, a couple other notes that I had. Sorry, I lost my place for a moment. Um, were that there were there were some comments about specific properties, the schools in particular, and and how the town would take those up. I just want to clarify that we we're not talking about that at this meeting because. Um, there hasn't been a request. We, we don't know what will be happening with those school properties yet. Um, they don't belong to the town yet. They still belong to the, to the schools. So I think, you know, keeping in mind that that's something that might happen in the future, but that's not in front of us today. And then um, an, another thing that I wanted to point out is that this policy would apply when there is a request to dispose of a property. So sell a property. If the town was going to take one of the, if the town were, if the schools were to transfer a property to the town and the town to accept that property, and then the town decided to do something else with the property itself, then this policy wouldn't apply. This would apply only if the town were to sell it. So um, one of the examples that Dave and I spoke about the other day was um, doing a, a long-term lease agreement on a property that's owned by the town this surplus disposition policy wouldn't apply because the town's not selling that property. Um, I think that's all the notes I have right now, but I can answer questions if that's helpful. Thanks. Uh, Andy? Yes, so I'll, hopefully now you can hear me and I, because I'm on the computer and off the phone. Uh, I think that the thing that I was uh, concerned about really gets into something that needs to be talked about early in the process. And I wish I had thought about this more. Kathy kind of raised the question in the conversation I had with her. And so she might be going the same place in a way, but the council may have either policy issues that it would like to raise or goals about a particular property. And uh, you know, the bigger properties like the school, like Wildwood, are certainly in that category. And I don't really feel like the council has enough opportunity early enough in the process to express its views on uh, sort of exceptional uh, things that could be done with a piece of property and uh, gearing disposition of the property towards uh, um, people who would bid on the property with the idea of, you, of, of trying to pursue those goals. So Andy, are you suggesting we, we put a, a section in here, sort of, sort of pre-decision uh, to sell? Um, I think that I am because I can't think of another way to do it. Um, Kathy, um, I, I hate to go into your, but you had a very creative idea, for example, about Wildwood that you had talked to me about. And I don't know if you want to share it with the rest of the group to um, let them <clears throat> know, or I can, but I think that it really would require that there be an earlier process um, in order to do the kind of thing that you were thinking about, because I've known of communities that have taken surplus property and had a goal in mind of what to do with that surplus property, 
uh, and what they wanted to see achieved uh, for the benefit of the town, either in its own governance or for other purposes. And um, how do you how do you go about doing that if you don't have an early discussion? No, I'd be happy to speak to that, Bob, if if yeah, you want. Sure. And it it's in I I sent fairly extensive comments in, but it was all around this issue. Um, so what what Athena referred to is some towns, but well, two things. One. The point about it has to be declared surplus first before anything really happens is an important point. So I think we need to clarify that in the way this is written. So with the example of Wildwood, there's a two-step process. One, the schools have to say they're not planning on using it and giving it to the town. And then the town has to consider are there potential uses for it. So what I what I've seen in other communities is there's been a committee set up once some surplus, potential surplus. So in terms of thinking in advance rather than a rush, potential surplus package uh, process that set up a committee that um, once there was a decision, and I'm just going to use Wildwood and the South Amherst School as an example, okay, not saying that they need to be packaged together, but what East Hampton did is it was a a committee that once it knew the town was not planning on using it went through that then that decision the committee talked about potential alternative uses with an open public process and came up with a housing option a housing option with public use so it was an interesting approach that they wanted in an RFP to uh, provide a gym, provide a public space. So I'm just using it as an example where Amherst could, in theory, say the top floors could be residences, the bottom floor could be a community center, could be X, Y, and Z. Um, so they did a mixed use where part of it was public. But for that to happen, you had to have some kind of committee process, um, both examining the current conditions of the buildings um, with a thorough, the soil testing and everything else structural, and then um, develop an RFP, which was asking people to respond to some conceptual ideas. So it wasn't a quick public comment. It wasn't like a 30 day or a 40 day. And East Hampton actually did it for a year and a half um, as an example, you know, really trying to do a thorough, and they were able to get state money. And the reason I think the longer process is the committee was supported by uh, a person who knows how to develop more complex RFPs through a state grant that was a redevelopment grant. And that helped them also have an RFP with an evaluation criteria. So I don't know whether we'd want that elaborate a process, but the main point is it wasn't a quick declare it surplus, take a look at it, and and go out for public comment. So the oh, what's sorry. described yeah, here yeah. doesn't allow for that amount of time. Um, and so that's where I didn't have specific wording and how to embed it. So just one other thing is the revision from the earlier, the existing one, which clearly has to be revised because it keeps saying select board, um, ML, MGL 30B section 16 actually triggers some of this because once it's a property that's more than $35,000 in, instead of a simple disposition, you're getting the property appraised, you're, get, you're going through a certain amount of process and you don't have to do proposals prior to disposition, but you can you can do you can decide a disposition that has conditions and restrictions on use when you're developing the RFP. So I thought the wording of that, where basically the old version kind of had most of the MGL in it, and the new version refers to yet in the very last sentence, MGL 30B section 16 sets forth additional steps. I'd like to embed it into our policy, the additional steps that we in Amherst might want to take when it's a major, so it's not, we're not talking about a truck, 
or, um, or something more minor. Mm -hmm. So that was just where thinking in the future, what do we need to embed here? And I totally agree that if we decided to reuse the property um, and there was a considered deliberate, pro we, we wouldn't be going through this. But I think one of the reasons town em embed this is because it might require a longer process, we've been sitting on some, quote, surplus properties for a while without a sense of what they might be reused for. So this might help activate a process that then makes a decision rather than um, telling staff they have to do everything. It can bring in external. And by the way, the committees always had the kind of people like a Dave Zomack or DPW. It wasn't just a completely external, but it had some, whether it was counselors, heads of other departments, uh, committees. So I'll stop talking there, but that's the part I'd like to see this enhanced to enable that once the property is going to be considered surplus. And I don't know how with a really large property, a large and valuable property, like the Southeast School, which has been sitting there closed as a storage cabinet, but the longer it sits there totally unused, the building itself is not very, it becomes not as valuable because you have to do a lot of work simply because it's been shut. So that's that's um, a long-winded way of thinking, of saying that I think this needs a different subsection that talks about a process for major, major property dispositions. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councilor Haneke? <clears throat> Thank you. In listening to Kathy and our clerk, Athena, on just the descriptions of this policy, I feel like I'm hearing from the committee and some residents a huge desire to have something not for disposition surplus property, but for unused and underutilized property, which is not what this policy is about. Um, so I wanna bring us back to what this policy is, which is from what Athena said, property that the manager has already determined he wants to sell, not long-term lease, which means something like the Belcher Town Road property doesn't go through this. That's a 99 year lease. Um, the potentially the strong street property wouldn't go through this because that would be a long-term lease potentially. And so we wouldn't even see it under this policy because this one is supposed to deal with only once the executive, again, keeping us in our lane versus a different lane, the executive says, I wanna sell it. And I get concerned when we are talking about getting into his process for how he makes that determination um, versus in a policy like this that's trying to follow the law of what do you have to do to actually sell the property and what would the council need once the managers made a decision to recommend selling the property? What should the council do in light of that recommendation? Um, if we want a policy that gets us involved in, gets the council advising or as part of the process for what to do with underutilized properties, Hickory Ridge, for example, um, I think that doesn't belong in this policy. I think that's a completely separate area. So while I don't disagree with a lot of what Kathy just said, I don't think any of it belongs in this property because it's all that was all about, well, what do you want to do with a large property like Hickory Ridge? And how does the council advise or make recommendations or get involved in that? That's not what this is. And so I think they're two separate issues. And it would be really good if we could concentrate on this one of if the managers made a decision what does the council need to from the manager to sort of 
investigate that decision. Okay, thanks, Bernie. Yeah, um, I just noticed the software kept taking my hand in. So uh, <laughs> I've, I've got to try and catch myself up here with the discussion. Um, I'm, I'm agreeing with counselor. Uh, the the uh, policy is about disposition. It's not about, not, not about planning for reuse. And if the council really believes that it wants to do some advanced planning around re reuse of a, a property the town either has or potentially will come into uh, possession of, then the council can set that up. This is really about what happens when you've got the uh, uh, three quarters of an acre property that somebody left to the town or the town has taken because uh, of, of unpaid taxes. It really focuses on disposal, not reuse. And it it's designed, I think, to give the council sufficient uh, information to determine that the manager has made um, a good faith effort to look at the property, look at what it's worth, um, and um, uh, you, you know, and, and offer that. Um, I think we're getting off the beaten path here. It, it's really, it, it's not a planning, it's not designed to be a planning process. And it's not designed to encompass Wildwood or um, the South Amherst School, which I was just walking by prior to this meeting. Um, it, it, it's in, it's designed to say that this is something we own, we have, and we'd like to dispose of. And it, it really focuses on real property as opposed to surplus equipment, which is a whole nother, whole nother thing. We have an old, uh, old truck we want to get rid of, an old fire, uh, uh, fire engine. So let's let's go back and and, um, and and focus on that as opposed to a planning process. Um, the other thing is I'd caution because I noticed in the comments that why why was all this explanation taken out of the policy? Um, it's a good thing to take all that explanation out of the policy. It, it you you write the requirements of the general law into a policy at your own peril because the general law changes. And that means you're constantly looking around for whatever changes happened and amending, you're going through the process of amending your policies. So it's best just to incorporate the general law by reference with those magic words as amended. Um, and uh, you know, did, uh, I think this policy is, I, I had some, my comments were all sort of nuts and bolts. Let's define what we mean by history. Uh, you know, so I think the policy does what it's supposed to do I don't think, uh, I, I think that the uh, concerns that uh, somehow the town manager is going to make a decision to sell Wildwood without talking to anybody is um, overblown. Uh, we don't even own Wildwood yet. Um, so let's let's go back and focus on what, what's in front of us. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie. Andy? Well, first of all, um, it's not just about Wildwood because we also um, have the South Amherst School, which you also referred to, and that is surplus potential surplus property because it's property that we own. It's a significant location and it has value. And so it's a, it is a prime example, in addition to Wildwood, of property that is now uh, on a high likelihood of being surplus or could become surplus, um, which is Wildwood, where it is a significant enough piece of land that um, thinking about what the goals are for the use of the property and how it might benefit the town um, in, any, in any number of ways is a um, valid and important attribute to be able to make sure that the council is involved in. And uh, that I think that it, it's something that I find um, missing still from this because, uh, and, and it is, yes, um, bridging into planning, but uh, I'm not sure I understand what's wrong with that. 
Kathy? You're you're muted, Kathy. Um, I'm just. Can everyone still see me? My screen just suddenly ha got yeah. small. <laughs> but um, I thought the point of we don't need to put everything into this that we are talking about after a decision to dispose. So it may be that um you know for sentences like no longer required for public purposes so what i was getting at is we may want to have a public purpose to a property or a set of public properties built in to a decision to dispose but to dispose in a particular way so it may be we can add a sentence or two when it's a significant property there shall be a process and the council would set it up but what i what i and i can send people what east hampton did because i thought it was um and i couldn't find i didn't search for what their disposal of surplus property but they did do the double step they decided they had three schools that they weren't planning on using as public buildings. And so it was a question of reuse of them, private, and they were selling them, Bernie, it wasn't a lease. Um, but they they put in a process well be, while the schools were still occupied, knowing that, that that event was coming, they weren't gonna be used as schools anymore. So and set up a committee, and it was partly a council committee, to be able to think of the potential reuse of them. And it had lots of what this has in it, an evaluation of the property. How many acres is it? What is its assessed value? What are the structural issues in the building? So when the RFP went out, it, it did say to bidders, you can use or reuse any part of this building or decide to uh, not keep part of it. And there was a request to try to use the auditorium, try to use the gym. So what, I, what I'm thinking this is that we might not need to do a major rewrite of this, but I would I put a sentence in where it's a significant and valuable real property. The manager shall discuss with the council a potential process before moving toward disposing because otherwise you don't have time to develop an RFP. You're rushed to make a decision on what it's going to be used for. So it's it's trying to build in a distinguishing between uh, more minor and more major. And of course, if we decide to keep it inside that we're going to use it ourselves or we're going to lease it and not dispose of it, that's a different issue. Um, but what East Hampton does has done is very clever because they have a taxable real property back on the property tax thing, but they also have public space that's been protected as public space in both playgrounds and internal space. So it's a different kind of a mixed use. It's a public private use. So in any case, I just, if there can be some if we could figure out where Bernie doesn't want to embed an entire planning process into a disposition process and says the council can set that up. And Mandy's correct that this is only once we've decided it's surplus. So surplus is an interesting concept. It's not, not useful. It's just surplus. So that's where I was looking for something that says if we're going to go the external route, something that signals that there would be a process rather than just a 90 day um, comment period. And I'll stop there because I don't, I didn't mean to embed an entire planning process into this. And I do understand that the reference to the MGL is probably best left as it is, but I, it does require every resident to go find the law. So it might be, include a link to the law so that we know what we're talking about. <laughs> I'll stop. Okay, Bernie. Yeah, well, we, we are, we did get into a whole discussion about planning process. And again, if the council feels that there needs to be some advanced planning done for a particular property that we either have or we don't have, then the council can set that up. And yeah, we can embed links into the policy so people can find the, the legal references. 
I wouldn't have a problem putting in under the, 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 the heading policy and process for disposing of surplus real property that the town manager um, discuss with the council uh, uh, what process might be used for a particular property. And it also, by the way, the council has a, re this is a request to the council. So the council has a final disposition of this. It, it doesn't mean that whatever the town manager proposes happens. It means the town manager comes uh, comes to the council with uh, the the best possible alternative that they've determined. So um, yeah, if you want to put a sentence in there that says you know we're, we we have to we have to uh, uh, the council gets to determine whether a property is significant or not, and that triggers a different planning process. That's fine, but for our purposes and our discussion here. You know what East Hampton did is is interesting. It's not uh, the first time. It's not unusual. Um, it uh, you know they've they've been uh, I've been involved in a number of public private discussions about property use. Um, so what East Hampton did was certainly cutting edge. I and I do uh, congratulate them on the being able to get a grant to uh, to to pay for the process because it's one of my concerns about this policy. Uh, in, in the small part piece of it, and also in the larger piece, is the amount of, of cost that's going to be in, involved in this and the amount of staff time it's going to take. So, okay, um, let's agree that we'll put a sentence in that paragraph that uh, gives the council some assurance that they will be able to uh, say this is a significant parcel and uh, we want a greater, pro uh, more elaborate process uh, and, and move on. Alicia? Hmm. Um, thank you. So I, I was essentially going to say a very similar thing and to just point out that I think that what Kathy was saying before is also extremely important, even if it might seem like a little bit extra. Um, I think that based off of like the concerns that we heard from, from some community members and some feedback and based off of like what the clarifying description that Athena just gave us, that this is something that comes to us after the decision, after the decision has been made that a property will be sold. And so what do we do if we want the decision for the property to be sold to be reconsidered, which I think is similar to what Bernie was saying, but I think that we need to have a process embedded in this, um, in this document for like what we do if we want that, that initial decision to be reconsidered. Okay, Dave. Sure, thanks, Bob. Um, I think this is a great conversation. I'm I'm listening pretty intently here, and um, just wanted to make a couple of notes. Um, particularly interested in, I think it was Bernie moments ago, or someone else said, you know, th this kind of surplus versus underutilized, and I rarely think of town properties as underutilized, I, 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 I more think of them as kind of assets to be developed in the future and that may be too valuable to actually give up, too valuable to surplus because we have so many unmet needs. Um, and in particular, I think of housing. So when I think of South Amherst campus, you know, um, my staff and I have been and continue to look at the South Amherst campus as as a potential for something to happen there. And one of those potential uses could be for housing, be it affordable housing, mixed use, mixed income housing, um, um, market rate housing. So I just wanted to put that out there that, you know, underutilized may not be exactly a word, you know, from a staff standpoint that we we use that often. But I do think um, I also wanted to 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 put in context that, you know, as we are charged by Paul to really look at properties in the context of his goals that the council creates for him. And so a lot of those things flow down through his goals to staff to say, OK, as I look at the properties that are assets of the town that could be developed into other things, I think of, yes, Wildwood School, but that's not even a town asset yet, if you will, um, town proper. 
But if we look at the VFW site that we purchased, the South Amherst School, the Hickory building site off of uh, uh, West Pomeroy Lane, um, uh, Strong Street land that was mentioned by Mandy moments ago, I think of in the future, will we have the downtown fire station as a piece of property to reimagine? And the DPW site on West Street, if we don't utilize that site for part of DPW, what could that be? So I just wanted to put it in the context of, of Paul's goals that you provide. And clearly over the last five to seven, eight, 10 years, one of the, the, the key um, uh, uh, filters that we use or lenses we use has been housing, produce more housing. So how do we as a community produce more housing? And one of the ways we do that is to look at town assets, town land, and and put that lens of housing uh, down over it. So just kind of wanted to put the, the, some of the, the kind of thinking uh, of staff into this conversation. And I appreciate where everyone's going and and um, that, that kind of surplus. I was interested in land that clearly the town manager could say that land should be surplus and sold and it is no longer an asset to the town versus land that is 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 an asset that we could develop into something else um so i'll stop there thank you uh athena thank you bob there was um a couple of comments about the timeline and i just wanted to point out that while the policy as it's written now requires the council to hold a public hearing within 90 days of the town manager's request um, there's not a deadline for council action on the request and the council action could come following a review by one or more council committees. So if there were questions about um, what the property might be used for that the town manager is proposing to sell that the town manager doesn't provide in his memo to the council, then um, there can be a committee review and discussion process with the town manager and, and further questions can be answered at that point. So I just wanted to point out that while there's a public hearing requirement with a deadline, the council action doesn't include a deadline. Councilor Haneke? Yeah, and, and to answer um, Councilor Walker's comment, the council doesn't have to vote to dispose of it. And so if the council, if, if the manager says, you know, comes to the council under this policy and says, sell the South Amherst property. I'll just pick that one, for example. And the council looks at the memo, looks at stuff, and then, you know, hears from Dave Zomek about his thoughts on things. You know, I'm just making stuff up here. Here's from the public and says, you know what? It's, we're not ready to dispose of that. That might be a valuable property in the future. The council can say, can vote no. And then it's back to the planning process. So just because the manager brings us a request to sell the property doesn't mean we have to agree with it. We could always, as Athena just said, go back and say, you know, the memo wasn't complete enough. We want more information on X, Y, and Z. So, you know, I I look at this and and say, what do we want in that initial memo? And what what else are we missing or have we put too much in these one to 12 that the memo is too hard do we need all of that at first look or could we start with more basic information and then go back and say you know and say you know for this property we don't actually need independently prepared salvage structure cost effective but maybe for another property we do um, because maybe we don't need it because it's obvious we're not going to keep this building because it's in horrible condition, Hitchcock or something, the Hitchcock, the old Hitchcock Center or something. Um, so I'd love to talk about what these one to twelves are and and get into whether we want more items in the memo or less items in the memo, and then whether we want to add anything beyond the manager bringing us a memo, like it's going to get referred to committees or things like that too, that we would require things to happen instead of just think about them happening. Kathy? Um, 
Mandy, thank you for bringing this up because I think what had me feeling there's no process in here was that before we get this memo, the town manager was supposed to have thought through with staff alternative uses for the property, any public benefits, what restrictions might be property, and this long list. And that's what to me is a planning process on potential use of the property. And I thought this is quite a memo we're getting if it's if it's a major property. If it's, as Bernie said, if it's a small thing, it's like you don't need to do all of that. So um, the I think if it's significant property, it does need a process. So this idea that the the town manager would discuss with the council what process they might want to put in place, including establishing an X, Y, or Z. But this is, um, I'm not ready to rewrite this one through 12, but it did strike me that we were asking the staff to do all the things I just said I would like to do with a major property that's a public process. And they're supposed to come in one memo. Then the council goes out the way this says it, the council goes out and gets public comment, but it's too much to ask that all of that happen for a major piece of property. Um, and and that's what I found intriguing about this one town. And I think I, I was looking, Deerfield might have done something similar. Um, knowing where a property was going, they set up a process so that the town manager, at the point they were disposing of it, they already had some idea of where they were going with an RFP, but it wasn't because internally they came up with every idea and every option. So, so I don't know how we do that today or not. And I really, Athena, I would love to get a word version of this afterwards so I can kind of think about it, but, but it's, um, it is that wording all the way through that had me say, this is all an internal staff. No one even knows what's happening. It comes to the council and then the council reacts. That It puts us in a reactive rather than a um, advanced assets to be developed, which is what Dave Tomac talked about. It shouldn't be just town staff thinking about an extremely valuable piece of pub public land and public building on what could be done with it. So it's a simple sentence that says there, the council could work with the town manager could set up something would help me understand what will happen when it's major. Oh. Thank you. So I think, you know, I haven't really investigated East Hamptons. Uh, I don't think there's processes based on a policy. I think it was the executive saying, here's how we're going to investigate disposing of these properties. It was a memo that was developed by the town staff and said, when we're thinking about it, we're going to put a committee together and here's how we're going to do it. It's not, you, you Im imply that it's just the town staff. The, the executive could form a committee of lots of people to investigate what to do with, with a piece of property, to whether to do all these things. It doesn't, you know, I, th I think that doesn't preclude the ability of the, of the manager to put together a committee and do a very public process before delivering it to the council. So I, I would I we, we can call over at East Hampton see what their actual policy is versus what their action was I believe was the executive putting this together um, from what I could read quickly online so I think you know the the idea is we're trying to look at the roles and responsibilities of the council and the manager and that this is a policy just about getting to disposition council holds the ultimate power and authority to say yes or no. And to say this was not good enough, we need more involvement of the public, or however you think it should happen. So I think this this is a relatively simple policy about, you know, what do you need to make the decision? Um, and I think you get you start to getting more detailed of it. It's going to be more and more complex and cumbersome in order to dispose of something that everybody knows we want to get rid of. Yeah, it's, um, I guess maybe we should focus on the one through 12, because um, I think I, I'm hearing that, I'm hearing two things. I'm hearing one thing, which is um, we really should lay out a process for 
making the decision as to whether we want to sell something or not. And the second thing is, what do we need to know about something in order to, before we dispose of it, before we sell it? Um, and I'm not sure that we're, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that this, this policy is, is the place to do that. <laughs> um, so anyway, maybe we should, because I, when I look at one through 12, I see a lot of the steps in making a decision as to what you want to use this property for. Um, it's not just before we sell it, we have to, you know, we have to do X, Y, Z. Um, it's really, you know, we, we really look at, you know, what are the potential future uses of this property? You know, what makes sense economically? Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm misreading one through 12, but maybe if we go through one through 12, we can at least put some, you know, put some bounds on, on this policy itself. Um, and then, you know, move on from there. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, maybe just go through each one. Um, do we, I mean, I, one of the questions that um, came up, uh, I, th I think it's here is, you know, um, how far back do you go in history? Um, what is, the, you know, what do you mean by, you know, future uses, um, you know, et cetera. So I think there's some question from the public, at least on what do we mean by history and past uses and how far back do we go? And then, you know, does the current use, is the current use really relevant uh, to a decision to uh, dispose of something? Bernie? Uh, you're muted, Bernie. That, that wasn't from the public. That was me because I've been there. Um, yeah, you, you know, when you say it's, it's, it's history, history and past uses are, you know, um, I would just say past use. And, you know, rely on what's in the uh, uh, assessor's records, uh, because as a historian, if you want to, you know, do, do you really want to know if the, uh, the, the uh, uh, property was involved in a, a significant historical event or, or uh, <laughs> do you want to know what its previous use was? Uh, my, my other concern would be, the concern is just, how, you know, how far back do you want to go um, in terms of past use? And sometimes it, uh, it it pays to go go back significantly if you understand that the property had some industrial uh, purpose way back when. So that was that was it. Um, uh, you know, let's we need to. I, I think we need to set a limit on this. Um, yeah, and again, I would uh, uh, possibly rely on the assessor's records as to uh, uh, for what what past use the property had. Well, maybe that's something we could, uh, you know, that would be something to, you You would want to include a historian, a town historian in your decision-making group. Uh, uh, that's but that's not what, that's exactly what I'm trying to avoid. You see. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, we, we have a tendency, we towns in New England have a tendency not to throw anything away, to reuse everything, which is fine. Um, towns in New England also have a tendency to go back to ancient times, which is not necessary. I mean, if we're talking about a piece of property that the town has taken for back taxes and we want to declare it surplus, and it sits in the middle of a subdivision, why in the world would you want to incorporate uh, anything more than um, its its previous use uh, uh, in in this uh, in, in this discussion? Why would you want to get a town historian involved? Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to get this to be simple and direct, which is stuff we have. We have problems with simple and direct in Amherst. So, so do, we, do we really need past uses then? We just need past to use, past use, um, um, and you know, just just past use. So, and again, relying on the assessor's record for what um, for what those past use use were. Mm -hmm. You know, or, or immediate past, immediate past use. 
So, um, uh, and again, if the council feels that they need to go back into ancient times on something, the council can then reject this and say, we need to go back to ancient times. But for, for, a, a, for just for practical purposes, just to move this along. And, you know, I really don't know how many properties we're talking about either. We're spending a lot of time talking about this. And we may have what? Uh, I don't know how many properties we have that, that we want a surplus. Because again, is is you know um, both tradition and and Dave Zomack's careful process, um, we tend to look real hard at things that we own and figure out how we can make better use of them rather than get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Councilor Haneke, um, going with what what Bernie was saying, I, is current use really relevant to whether we're going to dispose of it or not? Or I think actually. Um, Bob, you were saying that, and you know, it might be useful to know, and it's probably not hard to figure out. Um, so, but I, I guess I could probably get rid of it. Past uses, um, immediate past use would be good, but I also wonder if knowing, if we're looking, if the council's trying to decide whether this is something that a correct decision was made to sell versus keep for potential reuse, um, knowledge of whether there is any past use that might affect reuse of the property. Um, I'm not sure how that would be worded, but but as as Bernie was saying, if it was a past use of like like the the DPW location now or any of the there's many DPW locations, if we reuse it for 50 years into something else and then decide that it's surplus property and want to sell it, it might be worth knowing that it was a DPW location at some point or a salt shed at some point um, because it might affect how we think about the po potential for governmental reuse. But I don't know how to how to put that in there or whether just past uses or immediate past uses is good enough. Um, yeah, otherwise I think number one is fine. I agree with the history though. We don't really need the history if we're thinking about disposition of properties that run the gamut from tax title in a subdivision to large parcel that is in a forested area, but might be able to be developed. Yeah, I, I, I can see that you would, you definitely want to know if there's any past use that affects, you know, that, that restricts future use. Um, I'm thinking of a brownfield situation that you, you could not put residences in a place without without cleaning up, say, soil contamination, um, whereas you might be able to put some, you know, office building in there um, without as stringent to clean up. Um, so. Okay, uh, this is an addition. The second one is an addition. I don't know who put that in there, but maybe we should, whoever put that in can talk about what. So so I put it in. Okay. Um, I, I had seen it in the current policy and you know, I, I don't know whether something would come to the council for disposition that wasn't within the council's custody to dispose of mm -hmm. or whether that would have already been taken care of. But um, I, I thought it would be useful as part of the memo, if it's not already in the council's custody, to know it's not and that we'd have to take custody of it um, in order to dispose of it. So I, it shouldn't be a hard thing to, to add to the memo, but I think it's worth knowing whether we have one step or two steps. And and Mandy, that's in the current policy. So, so you just, it made it clear that someone has to have released custody of it. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. Yeah. That sounds re reasonable. Uh, three, Matt. Comments on that? Uh, commented source of the map. I can't re read everything because the things are getting in the way. Again, that was a, a suggestion I made that, you know, if we're going to have a map of the property and the budding parcels, 
um, it, it may be certainly before it gets sold, it's going to have to be surveyed. Yeah. Yeah. You can't rely on assessors maps, their uh, approximations, but for the purpose of informing the council, uh, as to whether or not this is disposed, could, should be disposed of, I think, uh, um, you know, the assessor's maps would probably, uh, would, uh, would probably survive, suffice. Yeah. Okay, so, gosh, again, I'm not, the question is for number four, is whether we should have that for each abutting parcel as well, or just do we just need the existing zoning status of the property in, in question? Mandy has her hand up, Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Keep moving things around, sorry. No, that, that's <laughs> fine. I, I wonder, this one I thought about, I didn't myself propose any changes. I'm not, I, and then when I thought about it, I figured all it's asking for is the zoning map is my, my belief. And if it's all it's asking for is essentially the zoning map of, oh, this parcel is in the BL or this parcel is in the RO, I think that's fine. I, I don't know whether we would need initially zoning changes that have been made within the past five years. I'm not sure what that would provide the council in helping to make its decision as to whether to dispose of it or not um, versus what the existing status is because the existing status is the existing status. If you dispose of it, that's what falls um, and that's what applies. Um, and if you've got the zoning status, if it is really just the zoning map of what what um, district it's in, it, you'll have it for the abutters too, because it's just going to be on the map. But I, I'm not sure it's necessary for the abutting parcels either, unless there's a concern. But I don't have an, anything against the abutting parcels. But I'm leaning more towards requesting deleting the zoning changes made within the past five years, because I'm not sure how useful that is for deciding whether to dispose of the property or not. Yeah, I, I I tend to agree with that. I totally agree. I I don't know I don't know why it's relevant. And you know the only the existing zoning status would I think I'm trying to think that where there is a school it may be zoned for education even though it's in the X Y Z zone. So clearly the um. I don't know what the South Amherst school is currently zoned as, for example, Dave Zomek. It hasn't been used as a school in a long time, so I'm assuming it's just in the residential zone that it's in the residential zone. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, five. Just real quick, education uses tend to be exempted from the zoning bylaws. Oh. So you, you could have a school in the middle of a residential district. Right. You could have a school in the middle of an industrial district. So it doesn't have to be it you, you want to know what the you want to know what the the the, the existing zoning is. And, and again, an educational use is 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 an exempt um, use. Okay, so five, I, there weren't any comments on five. Um, six was an addition. I guess, what does usable condition mean? <laughs> um, I, no, I, I said, does uh, usable condition refer to its immediate past use? Um, and uh, you know, then made the remark that we probably might just fold this requirement into uh, uh, what was discussion number six and is now discussion number ten. Item number ten. Um, 
you, you know, if, if you say we want to convert it to it's to a usable condition, does that mean it's immediate past use, or does it mean we can use it in another way? I thought six was, for that reason, Bernie. I thought it was completely problematic. You know, unless it's going to be reused as structured, um, the cost vary a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so the cost of restoring, and also the words restoring. Um, so, so I think it, you do need to, it's the conditions of, if, if we're not talking about the land, it's conditions of the building, right? I mean, in some way you have to talk about the, the wiring, the HVAC and everything else. So it, if it gets folded into something else, that's fine with me. Is that, does seven sort of cover that? Um, I mean, you might be able to fold it into seven and ten. I like talking mm -hmm. about the condition of the building. Yeah, I think it, instead I think of it, like restoring it, more of how, could you even is the HVAC system broken? Like you know. Yeah, so I would somewhere talk about the condition of the condition of the building. Um, so we have that in number one. Yeah, yeah we have the condition in number one condition of the structures condition of the structures maybe and we if, could add and you know and critical components you know such as hvac that would do it for me you know when you know just to use the south Amherst school dave when we talked about potentially opening the doors it was before anyone, it could be used at all, you had to spend so much money, X, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars on it. So it's. So then would we just eliminate six? I think we can just eliminate six, yeah. So seven. So seven was the one I read as. Yeah. Uh, if it's major, a whole lot of planning just went into doing seven <laughs> <laughs> because it's public benefits, alternative uses, environmental impact, financial impact for each alternative. This this is easy for a vacant piece of not very usable land, <laughs> not so easy for a building. So I wonder if, I, I think I'm the one that added A to summary of the reasons for deeming the property surplus. That's similar in some sense to number seven. I would hope seven was done before asking us to dispose of the property. Right. And so maybe keeping number eight of, tell us why you're saying we don't have a use for this now or in the future and we can sell it. We shouldn't hold on to it without requiring all of this analysis every time because going back to Bernie's example of tax title or you know gift at death right sometimes the town has left houses at death um bequests and we just don't want them do we really need an environmental impact analysis before we decide to sell it um and if the summary is not deemed sufficient, the council can always ask for more information. It goes back to what do we need to start considering the request to sell? And I'm not sure all of seven is needed. Much of it should have been done, but can be included in the summary for reasons to deem it surplus. Mm -hmm. Now, Mandy, if it said a summary for reasons for deeming the property surplus, comma, including any uh, analysis that reached that conclusion, you know, of of uses that reached that conclusion. So you just you, you're you're saying that you went through some sort of process to decide it's actually surplus. But that this is where 
I I do want that process when it's major, but it doesn't have to be right embedded in in this piece. No, I agree. I think we could get rid of seven. I think in West Andy, did you have a comment? Just trying just to make sure that we thinking about um, things that are particular to the property itself, like wetlands or brownfields. Yeah. Right. Well, we talk. I, I, I think. I think the issue that we we talked about earlier was whether there were any past uses that precluded future uses. I think that would get at the the brownfields issue, wouldn't it, Andy? Is that possible? Probably. Yeah. Um, wetlands and other limitations on development. Uh, would both be something that we would be thinking about, I assume the manager would be thinking about in whether there's potential reuse, but also potential for sale, or limitations on sale. Mm -hmm. So do you think do you, do you want it? Do you think we have enough information here? Or do you think you, we need to put something in here, as it in what is now eight? So is including any analyses that aided the manager in reaching that conclusion. Mm -hmm. Number eight is, is currently written the summary of reasons for declaring a property surplus, including any analyses that aided the manager in reaching that conclusion. That's what we're suggesting we added. What are limitations on development sort of comes up and will be considered a nine. I have a suggestion if we, Athena is capturing these as pasties right now because she's not working on a Word document. It's, it's me because I'm not, yeah. Or it's Mandy. So Mandy, when we were doing this, maybe we can take a second look at this because as we're moving things to other bullets and doing sub sub things, it would mm -hmm. be easier to figure out if we're missing something. Um, yeah, so, so right now, Mandy, uh, Andy can't see how eight would read because there's a white thing over yeah, it. Yeah, I, I don't know. Let there me... isn't any easy way of doing it, given that it's paste, I call them pasties, but I don't have a different way of. <laughs> oh, that didn't quite get it far enough over. That's all right. I mean, I, I'm glad you're doing it this way, but. I mean, we're not going to finish this today. It might be good enough for us to get to a new draft. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I appreciate what you're doing because you're capturing 
things that we're raising about each of the points and placing it with the point, you're doing it in the most logical way. So thank you. Okay, should we move to what's now nine? Doesn't look like anybody has any comments on that. David? Yeah, small thing, Bob. I, I just find the wording there is rather redundant. Two independently prepared appraisals of the property's worth and a good faith estimate. Um, good faith doesn't really <laughs> come into play when you're talking about a third party appraisal. So to me, it's just two independently prepared appraisals of the property's value, fair, fair market value. And, and an appraisal of fair market value is what a prospective buyer would pay for the property. So mm -hmm. I just think we could simplify the wording there and get rid of property's worth and good faith estimate. It's not. But then you you do need the words fair market value because right. you, worth, worth, is a different, worth is a different concept. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. Two independently prepared appraisals of the property's fair market value. Again, you know, when we think of, you know, when Bernie pointed this out, and, and I'm not sure if all of these will be required, but getting two independent appraisals of a three acre parcel in South Amherst that we may want to surplus, you might if you really require two independent appraisals, that might be more value than the property actually has on the fair market. So, yeah. um, uh, yeah. because that three acres might be partially wet and not even be a building lot, but you know, we're talking about very small parcels in some case, or, you know, small pieces of property that may have very little value out there in the world. But, but that's, that's true. I mean, we need, you need an appraisal because your other appraisal is the value that the assessors have set. Mm -hmm. So is the suggestion changing it to independently prepared appraisal of the property rather than- I, I, yep. In my career, I've had very few instances where we've used two. I mean, I think it could come up in very high value properties, but I, I can probably count on one hand, both in Amherst and other positions I've held where you've gotten to, um, and perhaps Bernie in his role in in in, uh, in public administration. What, what what do you think, Bernie? Is, is I, I've you know? never we've I've, I've never had a a reason to get um, to get two appraisals. Uh, you, it, again, I, I I mean you have. You have a one benchmark in the assessor's valuation of the property, which should be, you know, within plus or minus what five percent of the value, and then you've got um, you you've got what the uh, uh, the appraiser says before. Yeah, you have the assessor's um, value, and you have the assessor's value and the appraised value mm -hmm. from an independent appraiser. Right. What what more do you need? Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you, I think you know. I think one and, is fine. And that's yeah, that's also. Uh, um, I, to throw a little bit of a curve in here, um, I believe that Chapter 30B gives us some flexibility in terms of what we sell the property for. Um, so if we were going to sell the property to a conservation organization, they were going to add three acres onto their um, uh, as a, onto their existing conserved property, we might want to let that go for less than uh, the the appraised value. Uh, given the public good. So, but certainly, you know, you've got two benchmarks. Um, 30B limits you on the upside of your buying property. It doesn't um, require you to uh, set a highest and best price on the downside when you're selling it, I believe. I could be wrong on that. I think, I think one. You might, yeah. want, to, you might want to include here since the opening sentence is what the manager is going to be providing the council, uh, the assessed value of the property and one appraisal. Mm -hmm. Just put it together. Yeah, yeah. that makes and sense. And you have two. Mm -hmm. 
I will say the only time I've ever gotten two appraisals was really purchasing land for a municipality when the seller didn't agree with the first First appraisal. uh, appraisal. (laughs) (laughs) Too low. And yeah, just appraisal costs have gone up like anything else. But really, these days, you're talking appraisals going for 3000 3500 to, depending on the size of the property, it could be eight to 10000 So it's mm-hmm. not a trivial amount to get two independent appraisal, appraisals done. Well, I, I'm just throwing this out. We have the experience in Louisiana of doing valuations of homes that were uh, damaged or um or destroyed by hurricane katrina and we started out using brokers opinions these are basically real estate brokers would say what would i value that property at um and the um the public uh, uh, the public preferred to have appraisals and i actually compared what we had where we had appraised values and brokers opinions and Brokers' opinions were actually higher than the appraised values, <laughs> so uh, but, but you can get those a lot less. They're a lot less expensive than doing appraisers appraisals. So maybe for smaller properties, you know, we could just get the the assessed value and then a broker's opinion. You know, they do comparables basically. So it's, it's just a thought. Yeah, I wouldn't want to ask a, a a broker to do a comp on a three acre parcel that's a wetland, <laughs> but yeah, it's anyway. it's possible. I, I the the difference between you know the 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 I don't know if uh, and again uh, you know I I think we have we can have a high degree of. Um, reliance on our assessors' values. We have ca- a careful professional uh, principal assessor, and, and uh, uh, I, I think that uh, that database is, is pretty valuable, and it's a good start. That's fine. Yeah, I like Andy's suggestion of you know including the the assessed value as well as one independent appraisal. Yeah. So that should be added to nine. Yeah. It is. It, 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 she's she's got it in a sticky, sticky note. Sticky, sticky sorry. Note. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't risk writing that with my hand, <laughs> my handwriting. Okay. So 10 is one that I added. Um, and it, it gets at the issue that um, Andy and I have discussed where there, you know, there's, there might be salvageable stuff in that building that could be sold. And I don't know whether that's, kind of folded into uh, some of the other analyses or not, or whether it's folded into um, costs for demolition. Um, So, excuse me, got spam call here. Well, if you, um, that will affect the uh, likely affect the sale of cost to the uh, or demo cost of the property because somebody's gonna, you know, somebody's gonna demo it's gonna take all the valuable stuff out first. Right. Right. Um, and if you've got the people have gone through and and um, it's a, always a toss up as to whether a demo of a, a building uh, is an as an, increases the prop value of the property or not. So um, I, I think the uh, um, it's it's a good thought, but but the salvage uh, value of the components would be in the uh, uh, would likely get folded into an appraisal of the property somehow or or might be a uh, an incentive for someone to accept the appraised value and uh, and bid high Dave <clears throat> Again, my my only comment here is that independently prepared estimate. What does that mean? Is that adding more cost to this? You know, because no one's going to come into building X 
for less than a few thousand dollars. So we're adding more and more cost to this assessment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in my experience working with, you know, Rob Mora and, and other staff here, you know, as much as we would like to reuse building components and elements of buildings, it at least my experience here has been there's not a lot. We're not talking about beautiful oak beams in barns and things of that sort. Most of the time when we've approached this, it actually adds cost to the to the um to the demo uh, contract to do. So, you know, it, it's it's a worthwhile endeavor, but we've not, you know, yes, there could be some pipe, you know, some copper, um, maybe some flooring, maybe some some structural beams, but most of the time we we do kind of break it out and we ask the demo company to give some sort of an estimate is that a plus for them or is that a minus meaning is it going to cost us more or less because we're also trying to do do some of these demos in in the most environmentally conscious way we can so i would just for buildings you know an estimate of whether salvage of the structure or components of the structure would be cost effective i just worry about that independently prepared because that means bringing in an engineer yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dave, let me just add something to, to help you on this. Uh, the reason that I had raised it with Bob was when I was um, canvassing prior to an election, I uh, ended up uh, stopping by the house that turned out to be, I can't remember his last name, uh, I think Paul Wiley, or, but he was the manager, the building manager for the um, school district at one time. And um, he was therefore very familiar with what was in the guts of the two school buildings that we are about to move away from as build, usable buildings. And he made the comment to me that um, from his knowledge of the buildings, that there's a lot of valuable uh, material uh, that's in the buildings and uh, that uh, we need to make sure that the town doesn't give away that value, uh, that, that, it, uh, that it benefits from the value of uh, those components. Mandy has her hand up. Bob. Yeah, yeah. Council Haneke. So I'm trying to figure out whether this one's necessary for disposal of property, thinking about what we would have, why we would have this memo, which would be to sell the property. And so wouldn't, if there's a lot of hidden value because there's copper pipes or something that if someone demos the building can sell the copper, wouldn't that be part of the independent prepared appraisal for fair market value? Because if you're selling it, you're selling that component too. Um, and so do we really need to know salvage for a property we're being asked to sell versus salvage if we're going to demo and reuse the, the property itself but that's the reuse. That's not what this this memo's asking us to do. And so I'm I'm leaning towards not just deleting the independently prepared part, um, but the whole item. Ernie, I I, I would agree. Um, I also can tell you about uh, uh, going to Associated Wreckings. Uh, uh, property in, in Springfield and looking for marble uh, because when they take a building down, they take it apart first and recycle what they can and then they knock it down or uh, bricks from old buildings in Holyoke being taken out one by one and cleaned and s sent off to China where they were uh, considered a, uh, an essential building element. So, so I would just, I, I, I think if we're going to have a, an appraisal of the property, the appraiser can offer 
um, a recommendation as to whether or not there's salvage value, which would go on into the sale price. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, you know, Dave, from his experience uh, and the building uh, commissioner's experience with, uh, you know, takedowns, uh, you know, having some salvage value in there reduces the cost of the takedown, uh, may reduce the cost of the takedown. So I just let it go. I agree. Should we put um, some some reference to salvage value in the previous one, which appraisals? Yes, but I was I was going to suggest that Bob, if Mandy keeps doing sticky notes, you know, <laughs> the, the independently appraised appraisal of the property, comma fair market value, comma including any salvage value of materials. Okay. To to get at this because uh, hopefully if we're actually going to market, we're not the, the demolition people, it's the buyer. Um, well, it gets, gets back to what Andy said. We don't wanna be giving away a lot of value yeah. uh, that we could otherwise uh, sell basically. Um, okay. Okay, um, any comments on 11, didn't see any, or 12, okay, all right, <clears throat> and uh, I guess the, that's it, we just have questions in here. So, so I have, I have one question, can you scroll back up just on a, Mandy, scroll to where the um, council piece is. The prior to taking any action, the council shall hold a public hearing. Um, so is this, this time period, the council has to go out for a public hearing. If the council wants to ask questions or set up a process, or we have to hold a public hearing on this. Um, on the request for disposition. So is that 90 days dictated by statute was my question. Once we get this memo. It's a question. I have to check. I don't think I pulled that out of thin air. I think it came from somewhere, but I would have to check if it was in the statute or if it was a uh a practice that other communities had adopted that seemed logical to me. So I can check on that. Because it, to me, for the most part, we would just move forward. If it was, again, if something hadn't happened before, we might not go for public comment on a surplus property with a recommendation to sell. We might invoke another, we might say, we don't agree that this is surplus or we don't agree with the terms that you've come up or whatever. It's just a question I have on the having to go out with what the manager has recommended to us as opposed to potentially questioning it, putting it in. And so it's, it's um, cause I read this, I think everyone, would everyone else read it? We have to go out with what's been proposed to us is the way I re read it is the way I'm reading it. We can't go out with something else. Um, so, so that's my question. And it, it's just, it's a purely technical question. Is, is there a requirement that once something has been declared surplus by the manager, the council has to go out to hear on that recommendation? Or can we uh, raise questions about it? And Bernie's got his hand up. I did check, Bernie, by the way, in the old wording, you're right that it's possible that given special conditions, one might not sell it for its full market value because you've got conservation. That's written into the state statute. You just mm -hmm. have to give a really good reason why. <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah. but this, this, is, this is just my question on that specific wording on technical requirement. Well, you can hold a hearing 
and I, I believe that that's, I'm guessing that's part of 30B. Um, you can hold a hearing and you can, part of the hearing can say how horrible this proposal is. Um, and hearings can be called and then recessed to a, uh, a, a date and time certain. So that if you believe that after 90 days, you're not going to have the information you need. The council believes that. Um, they can hold a hearing. They can say at the hearing, we don't have the information, so we're going to continue this hearing. And off you go. Um, I, I've seen situations where um, actually planning boards have made it an art of continuing hearings on an on, on infinitum to get around uh, uh, making a decision. So, um, so you, you do have you have some flexibility. Is what on the council has some flexibility here. Is what I'm saying. Okay, I think um, does do, do people agree that um, we should just have uh, Dave and and Athena do another draft of this with these comments, and then we can kind of take a look at that. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, any other comments on this? Um, the last thing uh, that's on the list. Athena put her hand up, Bob. Sorry, go ahead, Athena. I was just going to, um, thank you. I was just going to offer a time check. It's 3.40 and we, we haven't taken a public comment yet. Right, I was going to go to. If the committee doesn't have sufficient time to really get into the, um, the regional school vote, um, on the debt authorization, then I would just ask that the committee send us their questions. Um, and we're, we're planning on inviting the school staff to the next meeting, or at least the, the superintendent and um, someone from the regional school committee at the next meeting. So it would be helpful to have those questions in advance. Uh, Councilor Han Hannigan? Yeah, I just had a question about that. If you're going to skip sort of discussion, what what is the deadline for sending questions and to who? would they need to go? Um, you could send them to me and let's say by um, next Tuesday, week from today, and I will forward them on to, to Doug. Kathy? Yeah, and I just want to make sure we are asking the school or notifying the schools that in the case of CPAC, they need to go back to CPAC to get that word, wording to address the wording, you know, so that when we when we meet in finance, it would be CPAC. Uh, uh, Paul probably knows this, but usually after they've voted out their uh, package and it's gone to the they don't necessarily meet between now and when we're meeting next. Um, so they'll have to convene a meeting in some way. So I just want to make sure that that step doesn't get lost somewhere in the process because it went to the finance committee. We can't act on that. We can just send the request. <laughs> so that will be one of my questions, but I want to make sure we put something in motion. Okay, Andy? Yeah, the only thing I'm thinking about is the four tenants meeting and whether this will, we haven't seen in the agenda yet for the four tenants meeting, uh, whether um, anybody it is going to be on the agenda for discussion. And if it is, it might be worth uh, just saying that the committee should send um, suggestions to um, the town are the, the council president and the chair of the finance committee uh, so that they're aware of the questions prior to the uh, four towns meeting. Yeah, which is the 17th. So. Okay. Um, so I, I wanna open this up now to public comment. Um, the comments can be on anything that uh, is within the jurisdiction of this committee. It doesn't have to be on anything that's on today's um, agenda. So if there's anyone in the audience that wants to provide a 
public comment, can you please just raise your hand and we will recognize you. I do not see anyone raising their hand. So I think we can just, I will then then close co public comments. Um, yeah, so anything else? Um, as I said, we were going to just ask for any questions that people have on the um, on the debt authorization, uh, re the re regional school commissions rescission and replacement of the debt thing. We were going to ask uh, for questions, and then um, we next week or next meeting will we'll have representatives here to uh, discuss this in greater detail. Um, Mandy's cut her yes. hand up. Councilor Haneke. Um, given that there was no public comment, do we want to take the next 10 minutes to to have a mini discussion or throw out some of those questions sure. so that people can hear where they are? Sure. Do people have questions? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm happy to start, but I'm happy to let someone else start too. <laughs> well, go ahead and start. Um I have a lot of questions and I'll, I'll try to go through sort of the, the subject matter of the questions. One is the, the specific wording of the borrowing authorization. I am still very concerned that it includes non-rotation of the track. Um, I was talking to some school committee members this morning about that. Um, so I'll have some questions around is that still a possibility that that this might only go towards repairing a six lane track in place? Um, concerned about what does the wording has been received mean um, and what counts as quote sufficient funding uh, to move forward with a rotation of the track and expansion to eight lanes. Um, and then sources, it, this gets to what Kathy was saying about sources, um, have, have CPA been applied for? How does that work? It goes back to what does sufficient funding has been received actually mean? Um, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so timing of stuff like that. Um, and then a lot of my other questions relate to maintenance costs, which are kind of related to this. I, I put it as trying to figure out whether we should authorize this borrowing um, based on what is the expectation as to who will maintain the fields and in what condition and who will absorb the costs of that maintenance. Um, so a lot of my questions go towards that. Um, if the field is replaced in place, the track and field is replaced in place. If it is rotated and done with grass versus turf, who are they expecting to maintain it? In what level, current maintenance or higher maintenance, if it's grass, things like that. And just trying to get an idea of what ongoing funds would go on that way. Um, and then also updated cost estimates because it's my understanding that the 1.5 million is supposed to cover a replacement in place, but that estimate I believe is a couple years old. So I, I'm gonna be asking about whether it does actually cover a replacement in place, things like that. So those are sort of some of the larger areas of my questions. Okay, Andy? Uh, well, Mandy's taken uh, uh, a number of the things that I was going to raise about maintenance, so I'm not going to repeat what she just said. The only thing that I would add is, um, are we concerned that there be enough playing fields um, within the area of the regional schools to allow all um, sports that could potentially uh, be uh, desired to uh, have adequate field space at all times. And I say at all times because I think that we know that uh, the areas built on 
uh, over a, a brook that's underground, that it's wetlands, that the conditions can be very uh, poor for uh, maintaining the fields for use um, at all times. And uh, I think that uh, that was one of the reasons that uh, we were looking for something that would solve that problem and allow for adequate field space for all activities. Okay. Kathy? Uh, a building, I, I'm assuming that Athena is capturing these as words, but building on what Andy just said, the and Mandy, um, I'll send them in as words. The If the track, getting updated cow systems, but if the track remains in place, there is a problem with drainage of the field that's in the middle of the track. Um, it was never, whatever wasn't done to it, that would allow drainage. So one of the things you get is is water comes off the field onto the track. Um, so so and now Andy's talking about all the fields, even the expensive proposal didn't deal with several of the fields. It just left them the way they were. You know, it it fixed the field. If it reoriented the track, it fixed the field in the middle. It was never clear to me that that the cost estimate included drainage systems that would do the others. The, the the original design, as shockingly expensive it was, said, oh, by the way, this we're not dealing with field X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think, Andy, you just broadened it a lot, but I, I would like to know if whatever estimates they're getting are at least doing drainage systems. I, and I, the reason I'm asking about this is the Fort River Elementary School a big part of that project cost is not the build, not the building per se, but it's dealing with the water level and raising the school and raising the field levels to put underlying drainage systems underneath them um, in a way that, that they didn't have before. So it's about the fields and drainage systems when they're getting cost estimates. And when you said sufficient, Mandy, I also wanted to know sufficient by X date, um, because the, the CPA funding also was, you know, this money is available if the project is moving forward. So when, what we're hearing from track and field people is, my goodness, at least give us a track. You know, you're <laughs> tied up in, in reorienting, not reorienting, but meanwhile, we don't have a place to run. So I think having a date certain would be good on a green light for something. My last has nothing to do with the regional schools themselves, but UMass has fields, including artificial turf practice fields. And I think we should make a concerted effort to approach them for the in-kind kind of contribution Bernie has talked about several times of at least letting practice sessions happen on some of those practice fields because they're empty a lot of times. And there's a new chancellor who wants to be part of the community. So I just think it's it's a side issue, but for, for our teams or even our ultimate Frisbee team goes to another town to play when we've got playing fields between Amherst College and UMass. So it's it's a side issue, but I think we should be um, pleading the cause of our athletic teams. Okay. So if you can um, put these questions, you know, write these questions out and send them to me, uh, I'd appreciate that. Okay, any other? Comments, issues, uh, any other topics that uh, not reasonably anticipated? So just, just a quick check, Bob, next meeting, track and field will be back to us and CPAC will be back to us. So, and then to the extent that there are updates on estimates, that's the anticipated agenda? Yes. Correct, okay. Athena has her hand up. Athena? 
I, I had added the um, the minutes to the packet, but I failed to put them on the agenda. So they're they're in the packet for today, but I'll um, make sure that they're on the agenda for next time along with minutes from today. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, if there are no other comments, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. It's 3.53 p.m. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye everyone.